in the right place. This is the Eat Fluencer Podcast, and I'm your host, Dr. Maggie Landis. Together, we are going to unpack everything about eating and discover the what, when, and how that will let you lead your best life. This is not your doctor's conversation about nutrition. Today is when you can start to love eating again. Let food be food and you be you. Get ready to get eat fluenced. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Eat Fluencer podcast. I'm Maggie Landis, and I'm the host here. Thrilled you've joined me today for episode 60, which I've called Atypical Anorexia or Typical Anti-Fat Bias. We're going to get into this in just a moment, but I want to um, let you know, if you're listening to this in real time, tomorrow's Thanksgiving. That's not what I'm here to let you know. You probably know that if you're in the United States, but I wanted to let you know, I am truly thankful for you, my listeners, my community. Uh, You continue to show up, learn, talk about these issues with other people and um, help me move this anti-diet mission forward. There's a lot of heavy lifting to be done. Diet culture influences really all aspects of our culture. And I know we talk about, uh, particularly in healthcare, but entertainment, the media, the fashion industry, just the way we communicate with each other, the way that we um, interact with our bodies and how we show up every day um, and talk about these issues in public with other people makes a difference. And the fix is going to require all of us because we are the culture. We're the culture, like when we say diet culture, it's a social belief system. And the reason it is so um, tightly held is because we all keep holding it tightly. So I really do appreciate your interest in this. And I have no other agenda in saying that, but just to affirm that I'm thankful for you and I could not do this without you. It's going to take all types. So thanks for joining me for another episode today. But today we're going to talk a little bit about anorexia. And the caveat I have to give is I'm not an eating disorder specialist or an eating disorder therapist. If you start listening to this, this is not individual care or recommendations. And if this is a little too um, close or uncomfortable for you, no biggie. Skip wait for the next one. Go back to an old episode. Um, If you feel like you are potentially struggling with any eating disorder, including anorexia, please talk to someone who is a specialist. And if you don't know how to find someone, I've put the National Eating Disorder uh, Association's uh, website, phone number, crisis phone number, all in the show notes today so that you can Find those if you or somebody you know needs them. Please take care of yourself. Okay, that being said, let's let's talk now. So most of us have heard of anorexia, even if you're not a health professional. Uh, it's an eating disorder. It is essential, however, to really understand why it is so dangerous. Anorexia nervosa has the highest mortality risk of any mental health condition, any, more than schizophrenia, more than depression. Um, It is uh, defined and the criteria for being diagnosed with anorexia uh, are defined in the DSM-5, which is the, uh, you know, sort of without getting into detail, it's like the Bible of diagnoses codes and diagnoses criteria for clinical conditions. But the definition in the DSM-5 says, says this, and I'm quoting this, The restriction of energy intake relative to requirements, which lead to significantly low body weight in the context of age, sex, developmental trajectory, and physical health. Weight is minimally normal or less than expected. Anorexia also includes an intense fear of gaining weight and a distorted body image. So that's the kind of definition, but... 
it causes it's it's a mental health condition, but it causes a lot of physical um, symptoms, and that is where a large part of that mortality comes in. Is over the course of time, the earlier things like constipation, headache, anemia, you know, fatigue, stuff like that from lack of uh, energy intake, really can lead to loss of menstrual cycles, hormonal dysregulation, osteoporosis, uh, muscle atrophy, and uh, ultimately electrolyte imbalances, which which can cause cardiac arrhythmias. Um, you can have wasting of the cardiac um, muscle. And essentially, people die. People die of anorexia. Um, there's also a much higher incidence of suicidality in uh, eating disorder patients, specifically anore- anorexic patients. So um, it's really serious. And it is a combination of physical and behavioral factors. There's a lot of uh, intense feelings of shame and self-loathing when, you know, having this eating disorder makes, um, amplifies those feelings because a lot of times it's extremely isolating. There's anxiety and OCD type behaviors around the food and eating behaviors. Uh, How common is it? Well, about a per 1%, just a shy of 1%, it's like 0.9% or something of women will be diagnosed with anorexia in their lifetimes. And that doesn't sound like eh, a big number, like one out of a hundred women. Well, 1% is, you know, a fair amount of the population, but I know for sure that is an undercount. How do I know that? Well, enter the category called atypical anorexia. This is where, you know, everything I've said so far, you may have been well aware of, but this is a uh, alternate diagnostic category that you may uh, not understand or have even heard of. So we're going to talk about that today, atypical anorexia. And what is it? And why is it important to understand and what does it represent by having its own category? Well, essentially, in a nutshell, atypical anorexia involves all the same criteria of anorexia, the physical manifestations, the behavioral um, characteristics, but patients are not in an underweight category. That's it. Sounds like pretty innocuous to separate out, um, you know, people that are in a normal or high weight category. But do you see what that does? By creating a new name, we have literally taken the exact same disease, the same clinical condition, and given it a different name in thin people and not thin people. That right there is the definition of our cultural anti-fat bias. And it is built in, baked in to our uh, healthcare, to our clinical, you know, diagnostic manual. It is, it is just totally, uh, the anti-fat bias is impregnated our whole I, I'm I'm speechless, honestly, because this is crazy to me that two human bodies that have the identical same clinical problem are segregated into two groups because the medical community, the scientific community, cannot even wrap their heads around the idea that people people with eating disorder come in all sizes. It is so mind blowing to them at large, that they give it a new name. And that's where the term atypical came from. The The word atypical, you know, if you look that up in the dictionary, means not conforming to our construct, not 
adhering to the normative model. So we, and I'm, I'm saying we collectively as a group, as a society, as a medical, um, you know, collective have decided that people with anorexia are underweight. And if an overweight person has an eating disorder, it is so mind blowing to us. We separate them into a different group, which by the way, we should not be so surprised that people in large bodies have eating disorders because we essentially prescribe eating disorder behavior to them in the clinical setting. The restriction, um, the portion control, the, the really rigid um, calorie restrictions and all the behavior, um, you know, distracting yourself so that you don't know that you're hungry, um, over-exercising, all this stuff that in a thin person is clearly criteria for anorexia, uh, we are telling people in large bodies to do. So let me just give you another example to like illustrate how preposterous this is. Okay. Cystic fibrosis. I don't know how much you know about cystic fibrosis. It is a hereditary chronic pulmonary disease. It is life limiting. It has serious, um, clinical manifestations that are lifelong for those patients and their families. Now what we're not going to talk about the, you know, physiology of cystic fibrosis, but here's what, here's the point I want to make. The majority of CF patients are white. That is a fact because the gene frequency is much higher in the Caucasian population, the, the predominant um, gene defect that causes cystic fibrosis. But there are CF patients that are Asian, that are black, that are Indian, that are Hispanic, that are all races all over the world. They just are not at the same frequency as Caucasian patients because of the, you know, sort of genetic um, distribution of that mutation. So what if we gave all those other non-white patients with CF their own category. And we, instead of calling them, diagnosing them with cystic fibrosis, we diagnose them with atypical cystic fibrosis. And the only distinguishing feature between typical cystic fibrosis and atypical cystic fibrosis was the color of their skin. Now you tell me how that would go over. I can't even imagine getting to court any faster than if a medical community were to recommend something like that. But that is exactly what we're doing with this anorexia, atypical anorexia conversation. If the data cites that about 1% of women have anorexia or will have anorexia in their lifetimes, the data also suggests that the frequency of atypical anorexia is probably somewhere in the four to five times that frequency. And I, I bet you even that is a undercount because I guarantee there are boatloads of normal weight or overweight patients with eating disorders that are in doctor's offices in this country every day of the week, right under our noses. And we don't even ask about their eating behavior and screen for eating disorders. Worse than that, we don't identify them and then we hand them diet recommendations and calorie restrictions and exercise um, tips and all this stuff based on their body type without even getting the proper clinical history to identify whether or not they have an eating disorder. So, Think about it like this. If we gave these calorie restricted diets to the quote, typical underweight cachectic anorectic patients, that would be malpractice. But yet doling out that kind of recommendations is essentially gold standard advice to anybody in a doctor's office uh, in a large body, including those who with some high frequency show up having an eating disorder like atypical anorexia right in front of our faces. 
So I know this is a little bit of a soapbox, but I want to point out how deeply ingrained our cultural anti-fat bias is in, in specifically the healthcare system so that, you know, people in large bodies are told that the exact same clinical condition is actually totally different than their thin counterparts. That's not so. I mean, that really, truly, that is, it's blowing my mind because it is nuts that we would do that. Both types of anorexic patients have the same impairments, the same um, psychosocial issues. It does not matter what their body size, their sort of absolute value body size is. This atypical label um, puts larger patients in a different category. And besides just it's not a nice thing to do and it makes no sense and it's discriminatory, um, treatment providers, treatment centers, insurance companies actually have different rules, different admission criteria, different compensation for these atypical anorexic patients. But it's, you know, so it's, it's more than just semantics. This is um, really concerning when, you know, we put starving, underweight anorexics on one end and people um, in large bodies or with, quote, obesity on the other end. And we assume that the two mechanisms are under eating on one end and overeating on the other end. We treat these patients totally binary. We um, like really split off two treatment plans and patients that are starving are told to eat. Patients that are in obese bodies are assumed to be overeating and are told to starve themselves when we know for absolute sure that some of them are starving themselves and we are telling them to starve more. It really is a total disregard for the fact that obesity, whatever that means, I'm doing a lot of air quotes today, um, and eating disorders coexist in people. You know, it really is a challenge when we are trained, when medical professionals in general are trained in this weight-centered approach to health. And we can't believe that something we, quote, typically see in thin people exists in larger people. Um, they have the same problem. You can be in a normal or overweight or obese body, you know, and like I said, those categories are meaningless because they're based on the BMI, which is also meaningless, but I'm, I'm using those words because that's what's in the literature. But they can still be malnourished. Okay, malnourished is like a functional description of nutrients being utilized in the body. That's different than underweight. Malnourished and underweight are two separate things. Um, yes, they can go together. They also can happen independently. So, you know, we're missing these patients, um, delaying their diagnosis, denying them care, um, and they have the same life-threatening mental and physical illness that somebody in an underweight body has. So it's really... Uh, a complicated diagnosis, this atypical anorexia, because having an eating disorder is already overwhelming and challenging and really complex. And when you add on top of that, this level of um, kind of invalidation that they're not, quote, sick enough, or they are, quote, still fat, so they need to you know, kind of keep up these restrictive behaviors until they 
you know, become underweight and then we will all be alarmed about it. Um, it's, it's challenging. And I will tell you that most, um, I've, I look at a lot of websites and social media accounts and, um, you know, things like that for eating disorder treatments. And most of the visual imagery is, um, thin people, or at least normal weight to thin people, um, straight size bodies. It is very unusual to see a sort of marketing piece for eating disorder intervention with somebody in a large body. So that, you know, kind of doubles down on this feeling that, um, they're not sick enough, that they've they are too embarrassed to admit or even speak up about an eating disorder um, that they may recognize they're struggling with, but they go to the doctor's office and they don't have the look. And if anything, they're congratulated for losing a little bit of weight or, um, you know, having, you know, such uh, willpower or whatever the, the words are. So it's super challenging. Um, and then of course, when they have less access to treatment and I mean, and I mean, you know, quite a bit less access to treatment, but if they get picked up, like, let's just put it out there that they have to first be diagnosed and then, um, they're less, you know, professionals, medical professionals are less likely to refer to inpatient treatment because the belief is, well, they're not sick enough. And the insurance companies sometimes uh, verify that by denying inpatient treatment when it's really indicated um, because of the level of symptomatology. Just the weight alone will keep people out of care. Uh, people with atypical anorexia also spend less time in treatment and sometimes measured in weeks or months less time. So for instance, somebody in a underweight uh, body may go into a treatment inpatient treatment center for two, three months. Whereas somebody in a um, larger body with the same condition may stay only a couple of weeks because they, um, because there's not a weight restoration happening it's sort of like, okay, we're fixed, we're done, you know, you're fine to go. And so there's a huge treatment gap too. And it is a result of our cultural bias. I mean, there's no other way that this happens. We collectively are the ones making all these rules and writing the criteria for the DSM-5 and um, making the uh, regulations for the third party payers. Like we are doing this. So the summary here is to say that I think the term atypical anorexia is a gross representation of our cultural anti-fat narrative, and it is harming people. We can't even get into our brains that anorexia and eating disorders could happen in a normal weight or large people, so we give them a whole category. I mean, that is ridiculous because I feel like the medical community, the diet industry, the wellness culture, this sort of healthism culture essentially instructs uh, large bodied people how to develop eating disorder behavior. We call it dieting and we pass out that advice every day of the week. It is on Instagram right now. It is on the magazine rack at the checkout lane right now. It is on the radio commercials for the diet programs and products. It is everywhere. So I want you to know if you're listening to this and you think you or somebody you care about has signs or symptoms of an eating disorder, whether that's anorexia or some other type of eating disorder, you deserve evaluation and treatment no matter the size of your body. It's not atypical. It's an eating disorder. And eating disorders are reaching epidemic proportions since the pandemic, especially. And um, it's just, we've got to take this seriously because we could save lives. And if you're a healthcare professional, please ask the questions to everyone, not just thin people. Ask about compulsive, restrictive tendencies around food. Ask about eating behavior. Ask about access to food. Ask about exercising to all people, not just the ones that appear, 
quote, typically anorexic. And if you have patients in large bodies that have, um, you know, documented weight loss, before you give them a gold star and pat them on the back, ask them what they're doing. You may be really surprised. And uh, if we don't ask, we won't ever find out. You may save a life, literally. So I hope this has been eye-opening to you and maybe um, hopefully some healthcare professionals will consider you know, trying to change this narrative about atypical eating disorders, because it's really just an example of our uh, cultural discrimination against uh, fat and uh, people in large bodies. So I would be thrilled if you recommend this podcast to others that you think would benefit. And super quick way to do that, you can just uh, click on your podcast player, give the five star rating, leave a review if you have time for that. And, um, I'd love to hear from you. I, I want to know what content you like best. And, um, as I mentioned, the show notes have the National Eating Disorder Association's hotline information. If you feel like that is something you might need, look forward to continuing this conversation. Thanks for joining me until next time. Thank you so much for being here today. If you love what you've learned, follow me on social media at Maggie Landis MD and you'll never miss a thing. You can also check out my website at MaggieLandisMD.com and sign up to be part of our community of eaters. Thanks again for stopping by. We'll talk again soon.